What's happening, comic fans? It is Mike from the Hardcover Comic here. Hope everyone's been staying safe and sound, healthy, and in a good state of mind uh, during this time of, uh, you know, 2020. Today, we're going to go back in time a little bit, almost a decade, to uh, the start of the New 52. And we're going to talk about some of the actual highlights of the New 52. A lot of people hated it. I didn't like most of it. Um, I accepted it all, though, because I am a comic fan. And after a certain point, that's just what you got to do. But we're going to talk about actual titles that I highly recommend. Some real standouts in the DC Universe during the New 52 era. Let's dive in. First and foremost, just want to say be sure to subscribe. If you haven't already hit the notification bell, bell, YouTube will let you know they should whenever we post a new video or go live with a new stream. Check out our Patreon if you're interested in hardcover comic giveaways. Um, very fun stuff happening over there. We're also going to be giving away digital code soon as these comic releases start to roll out again. Um, as biz, you know, as the comic book business comes back to life a little bit, but new 52, um, uh, right off the bat, I'm going to get, go over a few titles that I don't personally have any hardcovers to show off for, um, at least not yet. Um, and, and that is stuff like the Jeff Johns work. So Jeff Johns finished up his green lantern run in the new 52, ran about 20 ish issues. Pretty good. Especially if you've been reading his green lantern up until that point, it is definitely the low light of his run. Relative to the New 52, though, it's still some really fantastic content. His Justice League run is spectacular. I enjoyed it. It's a little rough at the start. The first two arcs or so are a little bit rough, but man, things really pick up, especially once Forever Evil, Trinity War, all that starts happening, you know, going up until Dark Side War. Fantastic, fantastic JLA fan stuff. Uh, really, really great work. Of course, it's tough to mention Jeff John's Justice League without talking about those sweet Shazam backups. Shazam was a... Uh, basically, you get eight, six to eight pages at the end of each issue of Justice League for about 12 issues, um, and that collected the entire sort of new retelling of the origin of Billy Batson, which has led into the current ongoing series. Really fantastic, really great stuff. So I got my little Black Adam out here. Can't recommend that enough. Um, and then in terms of Bat Family stuff, you know, Scott Snyder's Batman is spectacular. Um, there are There is an omnibus release for Volume 1. I suspect Volume 2 is right around the corner. Uh, Batman Eternal has also gotten an omnibus release. I'm sure Batman and Robin Eternal will as well, which is very cool. I'm glad they're collecting all that stuff. If you're interested, the hardcover comic is now doing a book club. Check out the information about the line app down in the description below if you're interested in joining. We are at zero year right now. It's been a ton of fun. Everyone's really digging it. We're all surprisingly really enjoying the second time around rereading uh, Scott Snyder's Batman. Fun little experiment. Feel free to join us. Um, but Batman by Scott Snyder was excellent, and that includes everything. Batman Eternal, uh, Batman and Robin Eternal that was included, um, and, and you know, pretty much up until Endgame was all great stuff in my opinion. There are also some other Bat titles worth checking out, like Batgirl. Um, I also enjoyed Grayson, which I know is not necessarily the new 52, but that was by Tom King um, and Tim Silly. Really fun stuff. Uh, and that's about it um, in terms of the Bat family. It's unfortunate. You know, Detective Comics was never really a highlight for me um, during the new 52. I will say, though, I apologize, Batman and Robin by Peter J. Tomasi is another brilliant Batman comic during the New 52 era, especially if you are not a fan of Damien. I dare you. I challenge you to read Batman and Robin by Peter J. Tomasi and uh, Patrick Gleason and not like Damien by the end of it. You just can't. It's impossible. Damien becomes so damn lovable uh, in his angsty ways. But um, that's it for the Bat family. I mean, it's kind of rough. It got a little rough. Even Batgirl turned into kind of a weird weird thing after Gail Simone left. Um, Nightwing was okay for the most part. And um, yeah, I mean, uh, that's it. That's it. Um, let's dive into some actual physical books. All right, so I'm going to hit you guys with a little hidden gem. It's called Dial H, written by China Meville, with a, a few artists, Matteo Santoluoco, um, a, a few artists work on it, but pr primarily Matteo Santoluoco, who's uh, done a lot of work with the new TMNT series at IDW. He's great. I love him. Um, so Dial H is a series about this guy named Nelson who, um, you know, is not taking care of himself. He's overweight. He's given up on life. And uh, one day he gets the call to be a hero, or rather he makes the call. Uh, Dial H is sort of the part of the mystical part of the DC universe. And it, the bit, premise of the story is there are these dials out there in the DC universe where, um, you know, depending on the dial, you type something else in and um, 
something will happen. And in Nelson's case, he types, he, uh, he puts in the digits that end up spelling out hero. And uh, what happens is every time he does this, he gets a random hero selected form. So he might be Boy Chimney. Um, he might be this snail who's armed with cannons. Uh, there's all sorts of characters. Really, the, the list is, is pretty limitless in this book. And you, you get to see all these new, fresh characters come in. It's really quite fun. It's, it's a great, dark book where, you know, Nelson is not by himself in this. He makes companions. He runs into enemies. He you know, gets his own villains and his own nemesis. Um, it's great. It's really great. And it was completely underrated, completely missed by a lot of people. This is the deluxe edition. It collected the entire series, which ran for a total of 16 issues, 115. And then it had a number zero as well, sort of going through the origin and the history of these dials. It's really, really cool. And a lot of people have never heard of it. Uh, a fun little pocket of the DC universe that doesn't get much meddling from crossovers or tie-ins. And you just get a great story about a character, about a person, a man named Nelson, finding a purpose in his life and making himself a better person now that he has this added responsibility in his life. Again, something we can all relate to with a great fantasy supernatural tone to it. Check out Dial H. Wonder Woman, have, th these absolutes are fantastic. I love them. This is Azarello, Brian Azarello's run on Wonder Woman. Uh, primary artists on this book were Cliff Chang and uh, or, uh, I think it's Goran Suzuka. I believe that's how you say his name. Um, but they were the two primary artists, very similar styles. Um, Cliff Chang, you, you've probably most recently seen Paper Girls if you're a fan of Image. Um, and Brian Azzarello, uh, primarily known for his work on 100 Bullets. He's done a whole bunch of Batman stuff, most recently Batman Damned. And the most recent Birds of Prey one shot that came out recently. This was a fantastic look at Wonder Woman. Ran for about 40-ish issues, so not the entire New 52. But what Brian Azzarello did is he took Game of Thrones, he took Sopranos, and he took, uh, you know, general Greek mythology and put them all into one epic sweeping story that uh, that evolves Diana as a character and her origin um, and, and evolves her relationship with a whole bunch of characters in the DC universe that again, aside from a title like Wonder Woman, you don't really see poking around a lot. What's really cool is you do also get to see characters like Orion show up in this. He's a, a pretty major second secondary character in the story. I love Orion, so it was great to see him. And uh, the artwork and the style in general is really fresh and exciting. Uh, it's, it's aggressive, it's violent, Wonder Woman, uh, definitely is more um a little more badass and less of that sort of um you know saving everyone and being ultra ultra kind it's really great um it's a nice fresh take on wonder woman uh with phenomenal artists and a really intricate massive plot line uh that i always enjoy i love these sweeping tales that take multiple multiple arcs to come to a conclusion i highly recommend wonder woman for any people who have been looking for a story to get into the character um i like this one if you don't, let me know why. Another Jeff Johns hater was Aquaman. He took Aquaman, a character that for years and years and years has been made fun of constantly over and over again um, for being, you know, a character who talks to fish, who spends all his time in water, who needs water to stay alive, all these weird, silly things. And Jeff Johns basically says that is not true at all. Here's why Aquaman is the baddest dude in the DC universe. Again, another challenge for you guys. Read the first issue. If after the first issue, you're not interested to see where this story goes, I think the problem is you. No, I'm kidding. Um, I really re can't recommend this enough. Everyone I have suggested reading Aquaman number one to, they change their mind immediately about the character and, and are interested to learn more about him, his power set, and the adventures that he goes through. What's great about Aquaman as well is that after Jeff Johns leaves, Jeff Parker takes over and does a fantastic job continuing the, the sort of epic and, and lighthearted um, and meaningful story that Jeff Johns had started with Aquaman, really working with, uh, you know, utilizing Mera as well. Um, so there's a great, great chunk of Aquaman material within the New 52. Um, once Colin Bunn jumps on, I, I don't recommend it as much anymore. It gets a little weird. But Jeff Johns really did a fantastic job. You get to see Black Manta, of course. You get to see, you're introduced to this, uh, the, the Trench and some older kings and kingdoms within Atlantis and the Seven Seas themselves with spectacular artwork by artists like Ivan Reyes and Paul Pelletier. I really, really loved Aquaman. I think you will too. 
Another slice of the DC Mystic Universe, Supernatural Universe, during the New 52 was Justice League Dark. Uh, as far as I'm aware, this was sort of the first introduction of a team like this. Um, and while, you know, it, it started off okay, I believe it was Peter Milligan who did the first eight issues, it really picked up once Jeff Lemire took over. Jeff Lemire uh, wrote from about issue 9 through 24 or so. Um, I've got a little custom omnibus here that collects 9 through 29. Um, and then as well as some other tie-in series. Basically, the Justice League Dark was a team formed uh, to, to undergo the, you know, the, the mystic problems that the regular Justice League can't take care of. As we all know, Superman's biggest weakness is magic, and so that means you got to get other folks involved, of course. Um, and here you get a great team, especially Jeff Lemire's run with John Constantine, Frankenstein jumps in there, or Black Orchid, Swamp Thing shows up a few times, Zatanna, Dead Man, a great, great team. The, mo the members do rotate quite a bit because there are a lot of twists and turns within this story. Uh, you do also get to you know, see things like the Books of Magic and a whole bunch of other stuff. And the Justice League Dark was heavily involved in the Trinity War and Forever Evil series as well. In fact, during the Forever Evil event, they had their own side event called Forever Evil Blight, which was actually wonderful. Really, really great event. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, after Jeff Lemire, I believe it was J.M. DeMattis who took over, and he did a great job. He also wrote things like Phantom Stranger, uh, the Pandora series. There was some, some Constantine tie-ins. It's really, really cool. If you're interested in the mystic side of the DC universe, Justice League Dark is a great place to start, and um, I'm sure you'll be sold on the Jeff Lemire run. Check out issues 9 through 29, at least, along with all the tie-ins for Forever Evil Blight. It's great. It's really great. And the new series that started with Rebirth by uh, James Tiny the fourth, and now I think being con uh, continued by Ram V are also fantastic. When I was reading the New 52, Jeff Lemire is really uh, one of the primary names that I started to notice coming out of uh, working on DC Comics anyway. Um, he, he wrote the previously mentioned Justice League Dark and the spectacular run on Green Arrow. It ran from issue 17 to 34, a nice 18 issue run with uh, some great, great storylines going and looking back at the whole island concept with Oliver Queen. Um, you know, Queen Industries falls apart. You start learning about um, potential family members that uh, Oliver Queen didn't know about before. Really, really fantastic. Gorgeously illustrated by uh, who has a man who has now become Jeff Lemire's partner in crime, Andrea Sorrentino. Beautiful, beautiful artwork. I was floored by both what both of these gentlemen were doing with the title. Um, so I can't, I mean, Jeff Lemire wrote some of the best stuff in the New 52, and, and Green Arrow is definitely not an exception to it. If you're a fan of Green Arrow, if you wa you've wanted to check out Green Arrow, you can jump in with issue number 17 in the New 52, read through 34, and you'll be totally fine. You won't feel like you missed anything, which is um, what Jeff Lemire does best. So be sure to check out Green Arrow uh, alongside Justice League Dark. The New 52, in hindsight, had a really had a lot of really, really cool supernatural stuff going on. Uh, Swamp Thing by Scott Snyder, no exception to that. He wrote issues 0 through 18, um, where you know he took Alec Holland through a whole bunch of adventures. And what was great about it is he focused more so on the horror aspect of things, introducing the rot, um, where, you know, the antithesis to the green, right, where everything's rotting and dying. And um, I really enjoyed it. Of course, there was a crossover called Rot World with uh, Animal Man. Um, which is another brilliant, brilliant series that uh, I can't recommend enough. Um, but yeah, I, I really enjoyed this. You get artwork by guys like Yannick Paquette. Beautiful, beautiful two-page spreads and one-page spreads with amazing panel layouts. Uh, and, and it's a great focus on horror. Another title that once uh, Scott Snyder left, Charles Soule took over for, again, about 20-ish issues uh, and did a great job as well, a really, really great job. You get to see Jason Woodrow make a return, um, and you get to see sort of this introduction of a, a metal society. Very, very well done. I think both of the gentlemen killed it on it. Swamp Thing throughout the New 52 was great. Crossing over with Animal Man, Animal Man a little bit with Scott Snyder, and then Aquaman a little bit with Charles Soule. Really fun. I really enjoyed the Swamp Thing series throughout the New 52, um, and I highly recommend you check it out as well. The last book I want to mention is one that I briefly just mentioned with Swamp Thing, and that's Animal Man by Jeff Lemire. It was a fantastic run. He did the entire New 52 series, um, and I, uh, if I remember correctly, he penciled the last one as well, so you get a little Jeff Lemire taste to it. But it focuses on Buddy Baker, of course, with his wonderful family and him dealing with his power set and his celebrity and, and all the, the outside forces that come in and start to, to bother him. Uh, you get some, some pretty good artwork. I, I liked it a little more when uh, Steve Pugh jumped on the title, but um, some solid artwork all the way throughout. There's an omnibus that collects the entire series as well that's fairly new. You should be able to get it pretty easily, um, so I highly suggest checking that out as well, if, especially if you've been you know, uh, 
wondering about Animal Man, you can't get your hands on the Grant Morrison omnibus, the Jeff Lemire Animal Man run is a very, very close second. Um, I highly suggest checking that out as well. But that's it. You know, I tried to be as brief as I could. I don't want to give too much away because I really do enjoy these stories and I do highly suggest you actually read them yourself. Um, I don't want to give away too much of it. There's some great artwork and some really fantastic writing despite the chaos and craziness that the New 52 was with continuity. And granted, sometimes you're going to have to sort of uh, you know, suspend your disbelief even more than you normally would with a comic book and just accept the fact that the timeline's a bit funky and, you know, there are, there are some problems with the way the whole New 52 was set up. But in general, you get these beautiful pocket storylines that work well together. A lot of them are self-isolated and, and you'll really get to enjoy them without having to worry about tie-ins and crossovers and all sorts of continuity crap ruining everything for you. But let me know what titles you thought were great in the New 52. I know there are, uh, you know, some that I haven't mentioned probably because I haven't read them all and I don't want to, you know, just throw them on there for the sake of throwing them on there. But let me know what you thought down in the comments below if you think the New 52 had anything good in it. If you didn't think it had anything good in it, that's fine too. If you feel you need to comment about it and spend more time on the video, it's on you. Uh, but, I mean, do what you want to do. Thank you guys very much for tuning in. This is Mike from the Hardcover Comic. Be sure to subscribe if you haven't already. Check out our Patreon. There's a link down in the description below. We do Hardcover Comic giveaways, Omnis, Absolutes, Deluxe Editions. It's a really fun time. Stay safe, everyone. Until next time, you stay classy, Internet.